This September, Japan quietly dropped a bomb into the global tech fight. It added about 110 Chinese firms to a new export control blacklist, companies across semiconductors, AI chips, quantum research, even firms that make the cooling equipment that keeps chips from overheating. On paper, it looks like Japan is stepping up alongside the United States to squeeze China's tech rise. But here's the twist. The country launching the squeeze may have far less leverage than it thinks. Ask yourself, why now? Who pushed Japan to act? And if Japan thinks it can hurt China without being hurt back, what it may have missed is the one thing China still controls at scale. Rare earths, the invisible materials inside, everything from electric motors to missile guidance systems. This isn't only about trade policy or sanctions, it's about two economies tightly tangled together and a game where hurting the other can easily hurt you too. So before we jump into the politics and the numbers, let's first understand why semiconductors matter and why controlling their supply chain is basically controlling tomorrow's economy. To really understand why Japan's move matters, you first need to know what semiconductors actually represent in today's world. Think of them as the oil of the digital era. Just like crude oil powered the engines of the 20th century, cars, ships, and factories, semiconductors power the engines of the 21st, smartphones, supercomputers, electric cars, AI systems, and even weapons. Without chips, modern life literally stops. That's why the country that controls semiconductor materials designs, and production has enormous global influence. And that's exactly what the United States has been trying to protect since 2022. It started a series of export restrictions to slow down China's chip development. From the raw materials that make wafers, to the high-end lithography machines that print transistors, to the advanced design software that turns silicon into working brains, nearly every link in that chain has faced restrictions. So far, Washington has blacklisted more than 15,000 Chinese companies connected to advanced technology. But the United States didn't stop there. It also rallied its allies to join in. The Netherlands, for example, sided with Washington to block China's access to critical lithography tools, even freezing Chinese assets worth billions of yuan. And now, Japan has followed that same path. Together, these moves are forming a coordinated wall meant to slow China's rise in high-tech manufacturing but walls have cracks. Japan may be trying to help reinforce this global blockade, yet its own economy depends heavily on the same technological ecosystem it's now restricting. To see how we got here and why Japan suddenly decided to go all in on sanctions, we have to look at what exactly it did and how this latest blacklist goes even further than America's. In September, Japan officially rolled out one of its toughest export control updates in decades. It wasn't a small policy tweak. It was a sweeping move that added about 110 Chinese companies and research institutions to its restricted list all at once. These weren't just any companies. They spanned every layer of high technology, semiconductor manufacturers, AI chip designers, lithography equipment producers, and even firms that make cooling systems used to prevent chips from overheating. In short, Japan didn't just target one corner of China's tech industry. It went after the entire ecosystem. Here's what makes Japan's move stand out. While the United States has mostly focused on cutting China off from certain high-end chips and equipment, Japan's restrictions go much deeper. Tokyo's new rules demand strict government approval for any export related to advanced computing, quantum technologies, or sensitive software. Even whitelist countries nations normally trusted to re-export freely, must now provide extra documentation proving that their goods won't eventually reach China. Western analysts quickly notice something unusual. Japan's version of export control looks even tighter than Washington's. One foreign outlet described it as unprecedented, calling it tougher than United States sanctions. So what's behind this bold step? Japan claims the policy isn't aimed at China specifically, but let's be honest, everyone knows where the real focus lies. The timing says it all. The same month Japan made its announcement, the United States also expanded its own entity list, adding 23 more Chinese companies, 13 of which were in chipmaking and integrated circuits. Japan's move came almost in perfect sync. That timing wasn't a coincidence, it was coordination. 
Tokyo wanted to show it's fully aligned with Washington's semiconductor strategy, tightening the screws on China's tech ambitions from every possible angle. But there's another layer to this, a more personal one. Because for Japan, this isn't just about siding with America. It's also about something deeper, a long history of dominance, decline, and a desperate attempt to reclaim lost ground. To understand Japan's motivation, we have to rewind a few decades, back to the 1980s and 90s, when Japan ruled the global semiconductor industry. Back then, companies like Toshiba, NEC, and Hitachi weren't just big, they were unstoppable. Together they controlled more than half of the world's chip market. The words made in Japan stood for cutting-edge precision and unmatched quality. But you know, success didn't last forever. By the 2000s, Japan's once mighty semiconductor empire began to crumble. South Korea's Samsung and Taiwan's TSMC surged ahead, building faster, smaller, and cheaper chips. Japan's chipmakers fell behind, not just in production scale, but in technology. Today, no Japanese foundry can mass-produce a 7-nanometer chip, one of the benchmarks of modern chipmaking. Meanwhile, China's SMIC has already achieved small-scale trial production at that same level. That means, for the first time in history, Japan is actually behind China in a key semiconductor process. To catch up, Japan launched a national rescue plan. In 2022, the government poured about $21.6 billion into a new domestic firm called Rapidus, hoping it could develop 2 nanometer chips. But here's the catch. Its core technology still depends on the U.S. company IBM, and production isn't expected until at least 2028. That's five years behind its biggest rivals. So Japan is watching its former glory slip away. Its old advantages, precision, reliability, and control, are now being replaced by China's speed, scale, and cost efficiency. And that's creating real pain for Japanese firms. Take the silicon carbide wafer market, for example. Before 2020, Japan dominated it. A single 6-inch wafer sold for around $1,300, and Chinese companies had to order months in advance. But once Chinese manufacturers cracked mass production, the price plunged to $800, a 40% drop. Japanese companies like Rome were forced to slash their prices just to survive. Or look at JS Foundry, a Japanese firm that made MOSFET chips used in home appliances. When China began producing similar chips domestically, prices fell by more than half. JS Foundry couldn't compete. It eventually went bankrupt in 2023. These stories show what Japan fears most, that if it doesn't slow China down, Chinese companies will flood the global market with cheaper good enough chips, wiping out Japan's remaining share. So, Tokyo's export bans aren't just political, they're defensive, a last-ditch effort to hold on to what's left of its semiconductor influence, but Japan's move came with a dangerous assumption that stopper stanber bober berbering oman sander stopper doper den or jopper stan bober di dan bor den dan tober toder shen tin berbori wor berbori in bri sten tober stator stan over ban dan stanber and dan briden ber stan wor dendron hit back hard. Here's where the story takes a sharp turn. While Japan tries to choke China's tech development. China quietly holds something far more powerful, control over the materials that make modern technology possible. We're talking about rare earth elements, the hidden metals inside nearly every advanced product on earth. These 17 elements are critical for making everything from smartphone screens and electric car motors to radar systems and missile guidance chips, and Japan, despite all its industrial strength, produces almost none of them. Because of its limited land and scarce mineral resources, Japan's rare earth supply depends almost entirely on imports, and here's the catch, about 60% of those imports still come from China. In 2024 alone, Japan imported more than 8,300 tons of rare earths, with over 5,000 tons coming directly from Chinese suppliers. That's not just dependence, that's vulnerability. And, well, Beijing knows it. Since early this year, China has already tightened export controls on certain rare earths, citing national security. For Japan, that's a nightmare scenario. Without a steady supply, entire industries could grind to a halt. Start with cars. Japan's pride. Every single electric vehicle uses 2 to 3 kilograms of neodymium boron magnets. The performance of those magnets depends on a rare element called dysprosium. 
If China delays or cuts off dysprosium exports, companies like Toyota and Honda would be in trouble fast. Their production lines could be forced to slow down or even stop within months. Analysts estimate that Japan's auto industry could lose more than $20 billion per year if such restrictions persisted, and it doesn't end there. Japan's semiconductor sector also needs rare earths. Materials like cerium and lanthanum are used in chip polishing, sputtering targets, and photoresists. Without them, prices rise, production slows, and Japan's efforts to catch up technologically fall apart. Even Japan's defense industry is exposed. Rare earth magnets are critical for radar systems, fighter jet components, and missile guidance units. In fact, the development of Japan's new Type 12 anti-ship missile has already faced delays partly linked to rare earth supply risk. Japan might be tightening tech exports to China, but China could just as easily squeeze Japan's lifeline materials in return. It's a standoff between hardware and raw materials, and so far the side with the minerals holds the upper hand. But this wouldn't be the first time China has turned supply chains into leverage. 